Nice. That was uh, Way Down Yonder, New Orleans, and it was written in 1922. But we're going to go back a little bit earlier than that and talk about the conditions and, and how things got started. Jazz was born about 20 years before it was ever recorded. So we don't really know what it sounded like back in those days, but we hear the, the stories about the music. And it was created and formed in New Orleans. And we do, a, we do a short version of this show for the schools, for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And the kids often ask, well, why New Orleans? What was it about? Why didn't it you know, start in Los Angeles or Kansas City? And really, New Orleans, those of you that have been there, is an incredibly unique city still today. It was French for a while. It was Spanish. It was French again. There's a Native American influence, Cuban, Caribbean music, plantation music, African influences, slave work songs, European classical influences, and ragtime. Incredible, all of this coming together in New Orleans. And Buddy Bolden was the most famous uh, musician in the late 1800s and early, early 1900s. He had his own band, he was a trumpet player. Many, many stories about Buddy Bolden. He was born in 1877 and died in 1931, but he, he had a middle, mental illness and went into an institution in 1906. So he, he played only when he was very, very young. He formed the jazz band around 19, uh, 1895. But there was another influence, and we're not going to talk a lot about it, but uh, you can't do the history of jazz and not mention ragtime. And ragtime was a very interesting development, and it, it was not created in New Orleans. A guy named Udy Bowman, he was born and raised and lived most of his life in my hometown, Fort Worth, Texas, but he often visited Kansas City. And he was in Kansas City with a friend one time in the red light district, and his friend was noticing pawn shops that had the three lights hanging out front, and he said, you know, I think I'm gonna open a pawn shop. And Udy Bowman said, well, I tell you what, you open a pawn shop, and I'll write a song about those three lights in front of your pawn shop, and I'll make more money than you will. <laughs> and he wrote the 12th Street Rag. And we'll give you an example of what that sounds like. Thank you. 
of mu musicians began to go to Chicago and St. Louis and Kansas City and LA and other towns as well. But it's interesting in that period of time, in those early days, the musicians in New Orleans weren't playing any solos. And if you noticed on that tune, it was all ensemble playing. The whole band was playing together the whole time. Oh, there might be a spot where there's one or two measures where one of the instruments would take a little break, but they really were not doing any solo work in New Orleans in those early, early years. It's also interesting that the word jazz, and it was J-A-S-S -S in the beginning, first appeared in print in 1913 in San Francisco. In a newspaper in San Francisco, the word jazz appeared, and later Webster defined it as dance music full of pep and vigor. <laughs> so that's what jazz was all about. It was always, until the 40s, and we'll talk about why it changed, but it was always dance music. So anytime this kind of music was being played, uh, if there was any possible room, and if there wasn't, they might even get on the tables, people would start dancing. So please, any of the music we play, if you want to get up and dance, we urge you to do that. In 1903, on a small island off the coast of South Carolina, a dance was created, and uh, we're going to have Dabney and Karen, and he may talk some other dancers into coming up and, and uh, working with them as well to demonstrate the Charleston. <laughs> and Ginger Rogers won. The next night they went over to Dallas, entered another Charleston contest, and uh, it was absolutely reversed. The other one won first place and won second, and they were just teenagers at the time. But the Charleston was incredibly popular, and still is today for that matter. In uh, New York, there was a band from New Orleans in 1916, uh, led by Freddie Kippard. And, uh, it was a good band, he was a wonderful trumpet player. And RCA, Victor, approached him and wanted to record his band. There'd never been a recording. There was a lot of recording going on in those days, but no jazz had ever been recorded. And they approached him and wanted to uh, have him come and, and record, and he refused. He didn't want other trumpet players to copy his licks. In fact, they say when he played in public, he used to cover his hand with a, with a uh, handkerchief so that other trumpet players wouldn't see the fingering. <laughs> Sound like he was a little paranoid, doesn't it? <laughs> but he absolutely refused to have uh, the recording done. So uh, the original Dixieland Jazz Band was white, white, five white guys got together and uh, made a demo recording. And they went to Columbia in 1917, and Columbia refused to distribute the recording. They said it was too uninhibited and barbaric. <laughs> and they refused to uh, distribute it. And, uh, you know, I talked about the, uh, this kind of music being dance music. On the label, 
of the first jazz record ever made, it says, and I quote, here are two numbers which if danced to properly are guaranteed to keep the participant at least two jumps ahead of gloom and disaster. <laughs> so they, they were encouraging people to, uh, to dance. We're gonna play one of the very first tunes ever recorded, uh, jazz tunes ever recorded, the original Dixieland one step. prostitutes. Whoa! Whoa. And a lot of musicians were getting a lot of work playing in the brothels and the clubs uh, in Storyville. So that really uh, started a major movement from some of the musicians to to go north, go to Chicago looking for additional work. Columbia was sorry they uh, they turned down the original Dixie Line Jazz Band because their records, and they made many shortly thereafter, were very, very successful. So in 1919, Columbia, trying to compete with Victor, recorded Theodore Friedman. Anybody know who that is? Theodore Friedman put a band together with Goodman, Jimmy Dorsey, Muncie Spanier, and George Brunitz, and he went by the stage name of Ted Lewis. Very, very popular in those days. He was a second in popularity only to Paul Whiteman in, uh, in those early, early years. In the Victor catalog, where they were promoting the original Dixieland Jazz Band, they described Ted Lewis clarinet playing. They said it was like the sounds of a dog in dying anguish. <laughs> that was printed in the catalog for the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Now, why Chicago? The musicians could have gone a lot of places and they were looking for work uh, and so much work was lost in New Orleans. There was a great demographic shift to Chicago. There were 50,000 blacks from southern states in those years that moved to Chicago. There was less racism, they were allowed to vote, there was a wartime boom in armament production and unskilled labor needs and meat packing and manufacturing and railroads. And they brought musical tastes and awareness with them. And they were joined by a post-war influx of Europeans uh, coming in after World War I, which is over in 1918. There were 40 languages being spoken in Chicago by 1920. Hard to believe. Prohibition started in 1920. And so the clubs that were offering jazz and alcohol uh, was where all the music was being played and that's where the jazz musicians were working. There were some wonderful players, that young, young players that began to emerge in Chicago. There was the Austin Hagene, Eddie Condon, McPartland, Freeman, Peshmacher, Lanagan, Goodman, Beiderbeck, McKenzie, Pee Wee Russell, 
Miff Moe, Louis Armstrong, and many, many others were playing in Chicago in those days. And it's interesting, the early, early recordings are all the jazz musicians that migrated to Chicago. A lot of good musicians stayed in New Orleans, but they didn't record because there was no recording studio in New Orleans in those days. So we don't have a recorded record of some of those musicians that stayed behind. But the most important reason, in New Orleans, in like 1920, early 20s, musicians were getting $1.50 a gig. If they were lucky, they got $2 a gig. It's a lot like today. <laughs> Some things never change. And actually, in Chicago, they were making about $40 a week, which was a lot of money in those days, and was certainly more than they were making in uh, in New Orleans. You know, we were talking the other day, remembering what we used to get paid on like in 65 or 68. It's exactly the same as what we're getting paid today. And that's not a joke, that's the truth. Some things never, never changed. 1920, as I mentioned, prohibition began. And in the 20s, the middle to the late 20s, the tuba was replaced with the bass and the banjo was being replaced by the guitar. And we didn't start the program with banjo and tuba. We have done that in the past, and then that would be more authentic. But by the time of the late 20s, it was much more common to see the bass and the guitar than it was to see the tuba and the banjo. We're going to play a great, great tune right now from 1917, the Darktown Strutter's Ball. He was describing the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age. He said the Jazz Age stood for decadence, late nights, illegal booze, licentious dancing, and a host of dubious pleasures, all enjoyed by societies the world over recovering from the Great War. Yeah! <laughs> so when the young kids ask us why we like the music and the Twenties so much, I just read this to them. Now, in California, Balboa, Balboa Island off of Newport Beach, there was a lot of clubs and a lot of joints and a lot of dancing going on. And the young people there were dancing in clubs very often that had small dance floors and they couldn't really swing out very much because they were so crowded and they developed a new dance. And that dance is called the Balboa and uh, became very, very popular in the 20s and 30s. So we're going to have Daddy, he's doing his exercises, getting ready. <laughs> we're going to have them demonstrate the Balboa, and I'm hoping Jimmy and Billy will get up there and dance with them. Where are you? Get up there, you guys. These guys were there in the early days, and they know what it's about. 
got the bright idea to shut down all the clubs that were selling alcohol. It was illegal, it was prohibition, and he wanted to clean up the city. Well, the jazz business was controlled by the mob in those days. There's no question about it. That's where all the work was, and that's where the joints were, and the clubs. So it really destroyed the music business in Chicago as far as jazz, hot jazz was concerned. The, uh, the musicians that read music and were in big bands and were playing dances in the Aragon Ballroom and places like that, they all continued to work and they didn't all migrate to New York. But most of the hot jazz players in the late 20s said, I'm out of here, and they began to go to New York for looking for work. Now, there again, why New York of all the places they could have gone? Well, New York had the radio networks, had the supper clubs, had saloons, recording studios. The Savoy Ballroom up in Harlem had speakeasies. There were thousands of speakeasies during Prohibition in New York in the Brownstones. The Cotton Club, dance halls, hotels had special rooms set up just for jazz performances concert halls, and 52nd Street. Hence the name of this band, 52nd Street Jazz Band. There was a block and a half on 52nd Street between 6th Avenue and halfway, between 5th Avenue and then halfway between 6th and 7th Avenue. It was just called the street. If you went to Manhattan in those days and you told the taxi driver, take me to the street, that's where they took you. And a uh, jazz critic and a friend of his were in, a, in the Onyx one night having a drink and they began to argue about how many jazz clubs there were in that stretch. So they decided to count them. So they started at Fifth Avenue and they went down one side of the street, down halfway to Seventh Avenue, turned around, came back up on the other side, having a little drink along the way as they went, of course. So he woke up the next afternoon and found a piece of paper in his pocket where they had written down the names of all the clubs. There were 38 jazz clubs in that block in New York, 57th Street. And you can see why it was called Swing Street. Uh, Red Nichols and Miff Mole were already in New York earlier before the major migration from from Chicago. Louis Armstrong went in 1926. He left most of it, except Sandy Singleton, the drummer, he left most of his New Orleans colleagues that he'd been working with in uh, Chicago behind and really changed his style when he got to New York to much more of a swing style and really began a, a, a whole different a swing of rhythm that changed jazz forever. And uh, we're going to play a tune from this era, written in 1923, very, very popular, called The Wolverine Blues. had 
conditioning, cheap upright pianos that they were using all the time to orchestrate and develop music that they were publishing. These cheap pianos all playing at the same time sounded like tin pans being beaten, hence the name Tin Panelli for that street. There were piano merchants there, and the major piano merchant was the Tonk Piano Company, and people began to call the style the Honky Tonk Piano Time. This was in New York on 28th Street. In 1925, in a New York newspaper, the following was published. Morphine, cocaine, and opium are powerful drugs which can be used to relieve pain. They're used only in this legitimate way by the guidance of a physician for a definite purpose only. In any other way, they're useless and harmful. And their sale and use are specifically determined by law. This is not so with jazz. The form of music called jazz is just as intoxicating as morphine or cocaine. It is just as harmful and yet its use is not determined by law. Thank God! I'd love to see what they thought of the rap music we're hearing today. <laughs> we're going to do uh, one more song for you, and then we'll take a break. And then when we come back, we're going to have the kids demonstrate a couple more dances for you. We'll do, uh, we'll do something that we don't always do at this show, but it requires a little more audience participation and you look like you need the exercise. <laughs> Just watch Cheryl, you'll know what to do. 